A blessed good evening to our members, friends, and brethren who have joined us online. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Um, you really have stuck with us, and, and we are uh, thankful. We, we appreciate that. Last week, we started a study on the promises of God. And before I do anything, let me apologize for an error made in my introduction last week. I, I spoke of there being over 70,000 promises. I don't know where that came from <laughs> in the Bible that relate to us. However, that should have been over 7,000. Okay? So just make that correction. Over 7,000 promises relating to us in the word of God. All right? So please forgive me for that. Last week, we... Just a brief um, recap. Last week, we saw... God as a promise maker and a promise keeper. We juxtapose his faithfulness in keeping his promises with our inconsistency in keeping our promises. And we looked at four reasons for us being unable to always keep our promises. I hope you remember them. There are four F words. Frailty or the flesh, forgetfulness, frivolity, or just fun, you know. People just making fun and light of a promise and, and falsehood, okay? So, those were the four that we looked at. We also understood that God's promises may be delayed, but they are never broken. Never broken. Delayed because he's not governed by the standard of time that governs us, right? He does everything in, in, in a particular time, in what, what is called the fullness of time and according to his will. Okay? We also recognize that as God's children, we must subject ourselves to his perfect will. And he requires us to be patient and to persevere. So join me in prayer as we commence part two of this study. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for your promises that you have made to us lord all of them are yes in christ jesus father god we pray now that lord you will just look down upon us as we go through this study that your holy spirit will guide and will lead and that lord your people will be blessed we pray in christ's name amen amen All right, so, so we begin um, today's study with this, this um, headline. God's promises are either punitive or beneficial. They are either punitive or beneficial. Or benevolent could be another word that we could use. All right. We like to believe that God's promises are only beneficial, but it is not so, okay? Let's look at what, 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 what punitive and beneficial mean, okay? Punitive is a promise to punish, and beneficial, a promise to bless, okay? So God promises punishment, and he promises blessings, all right? A matter of fact, the first promise, arguably the first promise that God made to man was punitive. Punitive in its nature. Okay? Um, in Genesis 2, after God had told Adam to eat from any fruit, any tree in the Garden of Eden, any tree, he could eat from any tree, he made this promise to him. And I want us to look at Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. Because this is an example of a punitive promise. All right? The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay? And so, death was going to be the punishment for disobedience 
And it was a promise that God made to him. I promise you that whenever you eat, if you ever eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are going to die, right? And so this is a classic example, I want to say, of a promise that God would both keep and delay at the same time. How, how, how did God do that? Well, after Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they ate the forbidden fruit, God pronounced curses upon them and upon the serpent that had tricked them. You remember that, right? And then you remember what God did. God clothed them with animal skins. Right? Let's look at that, 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 that passage. Genesis 3.21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And, and I believe that this was a sign to them that their disobedience had ushered in death. Because if you are to get the skin of an animal, that animal would have to die. And so I think this is the first sign to them that, look, death is happening, okay? Death is happening. The next thing that God did was to drive them out of the garden, drive them from his presence. It says, and the Lord said, in Genesis 3, to 23, the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And so this represented an immediate spiritual death. Because spiritual death is actually separation from God. And so because they were separated from God, who is the source of life, they experience spiritual death. The wages of sin is death. But they did not drop down dead. Right? They didn't drop down dead. But that was the delayed part about the death. Because um, 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 their legacy, they had a legacy from God. And they were, their legacy was to live eternally with Almighty God. And they were robbed of that legacy when they disobeyed. And they would, in time, they would experience physical death. So it was both immediate, a spiritual death happened immediately. Remember, we told you about the promises of God. Sometimes it's delayed but never broken. They experienced an immediate death spiritually, being separated from Almighty God. And then, in time to come, they were going to experience physical death. So by their act of disobedience, by their sin, what they did, they brought death upon all mankind. Okay? And so the final act of God now was to protect the tree of life. It says, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. All right? So doing this, God would ensure that their lives would have an expiry date. Yeah. Because if they ate of the tree of life, their lives would continue forever in a sinful state. So God loved them. God loved Adam and Eve. He made them. He created them. He loved them. But he had to keep his promises to them. Eh? So he said to them, when you eat, you will die. And he kept his promises to them. Eh? How did I know that God loved them? That is demonstrated in Genesis 3 and verse 15. Because while God did this, while he drove them from his presence and, and death came upon man, he said this to the serpent when he was cursing the serpent. He said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So God is here making a provision 
to rescue man from the spiritual death, from that separation from God. Right? And so how, how did he do this? He was promising a savior, a savior, someone who would crush the head of the serpent. And you know, the serpent is represented there by Satan, right? Satan is a serpent. So his head would be crushed, all right? And an injury would be received by Christ. And that injury would have been the cross, right? He died on the cross. That's the injury. Right? But, but that, is not, that wasn't permanent because we know we're coming up to that time that he rose again from the dead. So physical death is an appointment that we all must keep. And, and sometimes you might think that some people will escape death. But even those people, those of God's people who are alive when Christ returns, they will experience a kind of physical death. Yes, because their mortal bodies will be destroyed as they put on their immortal bodies, right? So that's what will happen to us. We will experience a kind of death because our bodies will go through death, will go through destruction so that we can put on our immortal bodies. So God's punitive promises therefore are like warnings to us do this or else don't do this or else that's what god is saying when god promises um punishment that's what he tells us that's what he's warning us right if you don't do this it will have consequences or if you do this it will have consequences all right so those are the punitive I look at the punitive promises of God. Let's look at the beneficial promises of God. An example of a beneficial promise is found in John eleven seventeen through 27. It's kind of long, so bear with me. Because in the same way that I spoke about life and death in God's punitive promise to Adam and Eve, I also want to speak at a benef to a beneficial promise concerning life and death that was made to us through Jesus Christ. So in John 11, 17 through 27. And this is at the point where, you remember where Lazarus had died? Okay, all right. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Here's the promise. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die do you believe this do you believe this you see <laughs> she did she said she said she believed but 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 you see you see, you see what 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 i'm the word of god is saying you see what jesus is saying jesus is saying that if you believe in me and this is a beneficial promise to all mankind all of us because there is the word whoever so it relates to all of us it says, if you believe in me and, 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 and live for me, so sometimes we want to just say believe, you know, but, but if you live for me, you will never experience spiritual death. He says, even though he dies physically, he will live. He will get 
eternal life. Yes? And so, that's what God, through Christ, has promised us. Right? So, he rose Lazarus from the dead. But Lazarus would physically die again. Right? As Christ is the only resurrected being, the only resurrected person, the only one resurrected from the dead, never to die again. Right? But Lazarus would die again. As a matter of fact, they sought to kill him very soon after he was resurrected. All right? So that's a beneficial promise. And I want us to hold on to that promise, you know. Because I remember what I, what, what, what I had said before. Every single promise that God has given us through Christ is yes. You cannot escape this, this promise, right? So if you want life, believe in christ if you want to experience the life that jesus is talking about believe in him and live for him live for him okay so we move on so those were two examples one of a punitive one of a beneficial promise i hope that you are understanding the differences between those two God has made conditional and unconditional promises to us. So not only are his promises punitive and or beneficial, but he has made conditional promises to us and unconditional promises. I call it, it's a kind of, what I would call a quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, and, and, and quid, quid pro quo is a, is a term that is used in legal circles, right? Quid pro quo, uh, we have to take your time and say that or else it might bite your tongue, all right? <laughs> but it's used in legal circles, and it's a Latin phrase that literally means something for something, right? Something for something. So, so that's what the conditional promise of God is like right it's a little bit different from how we do the quid pro quo stuff and you will you will hear that a little bit later on but i i i would want to liken it to that um agreement that we make even here on earth his conditional promises have certain conditions that are attached to them. I will do this for you if you fulfill this condition. But you can notice something. You'll notice that God's pre quid pro quo agreements with us are heavily weighted in our favor. Mm -hmm. We stand to gain more from this agreement than God. Whenever God makes a promise to us. And it's a conditional promise. You do this. And I will do this. We gain more than God. Hmm? So that's how benevolent God is. We always gain more than God. Why? Because God loves us with a love that we can't even fathom. And that's why. He loves us. Why? Because God is full of grace. Right? God is the epitome of grace. Why do we gain more than God? Because God is full of mercy towards us. God is merciful. And so it's almost like I, I, I want to compare it to a parent. And I want you to follow me in this, in this illustration. I want to compare it to a parent promising a child that if they do well, if the child does well in, in, in exams, in, in his, his or her exams, they will take the child on a trip to Disney World. Because right? some parents do that. Some parents ask children, you know, or, or they, they promise children that, you know, if you do well, I will do this for you. But let's use the example of a trip to Disney World, okay? Something that I guess every child would, would, would enjoy. 
But let's look. If let's look at this. Who stands to gain most from this agreement? Remember, you know, the promise is if you do well in your exams, I will take you to Disney World. So it's a promise with a condition. But who stands to gain more? All right, let's examine it. The condition is do well in your exams. Whereas I believe as a parent, if I saw my child doing well or heard that they did well in exams and stuff, what that would do for me, it would give me some joy. And it would also give me a sense of pride in the child's achievement. But I don't know if there's much more that I would benefit from that. Eh? I'm happy for the child and I'm proud because the child has achieved. But let's look at the child now. It is the child who benefits from being qualified. Hmm? So even though I have joy and I have pride in the child, but the child benefits from being, just by doing well in their exams, from being qualified. And that's a benefit that is going to provide a sound educational platform for the child's future. But look now at the promise. A trip to Disney World. Who is going to pay for those tickets? No, must me. <laughs> the parent going to pay for the tickets. Right? So it is taking something out of the parent's pocket. All right? Okay. Who will get the greatest thrill at Disney World? The parent or the child? Well, I hope it will be the child. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who will return with treasured memories of Disney World? The child. Uh, who will be motivated to always do well in their academic pursuits? The child. So you see, all the parents receive from this quid pro quo agreement is a sense of pride and a feeling of joy that their child has accomplished. So I hope you understand what I'm saying from this example. Because we benefit the most from any conditional promise that God makes to us. Any beneficial con conditional promise that God makes to us. We benefit. Just like how the child benefits so much more than the parent, it is the same way with us and God. All right? So, I want to... Look at a passage of scripture. And this will kind of give you an insight into why God sets the agreement like that. Why he sets the promise like that. Why he makes us gain even more than he does. Right? There's, there's a psalm that tells us why? Listen to it. Psalm 103. I'm just going to read an excerpt from that psalm. Okay? Psalm 103. Begin at verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all our all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles the lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love 
for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. That is God. And that's why God makes us gain more from his promises than he himself gets. That's God. God is a good father. God is a benevolent father. And he remembers who we are. Yeah, he remembers that we are just dust. And so he does everything for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And so I want to thank God for his blessings, for his promises that are even conditional promises because what it does, it motivates us to fulfill the condition because the promises are wonderful. They are great promises of God. And so I, I want to close here um, for today. And next week, God's willing, when we come back, we will be looking at our first conditional promise from God. And I tell you, it's going to be the first of seven, right? And I hope that you will join this broadcast and that you will receive a blessing from hearing God's promises. All right, so next week, God's willing, stay blessed and remain under the shadow of the Almighty God. God bless you.